listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed. Finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. For the average adult, there's nothing unusual about commuting to and from work. But take a moment to imagine the following events happening to you. Your drive home has you on a busy freeway. In your rearview mirror, you notice a vehicle coming from behind in the lane beside you. It passes you and moves recklessly through traffic, igniting a hostile reaction from a driver in front of you. These two drivers then engage in an on-road battle of aggressive, dangerous maneuvers. It escalates to the point of a multi-car accident. You just barely escape. The statistics say that up to one-third of car accidents are due to aggression in some form. If drivers prone to hostility were able to exert better control over their emotions, countless lives could be saved. We're constantly subjected to a barrage of positive and negative emotions, but our capacity to change negativity, like anger, into positivity, such as empathy, is what distinguishes us as human beings. This ability to accurately sense your emotions and those of others, and to respond appropriately, extends far beyond the freeway. It can bring life-changing improvements to your relationships at home, with friends, and at work. On the job, for example, studies show that those with higher emotional intelligence earn up to $29,000 more than those with low EQ. In fact, emotional intelligence is the critical factor that explains the peculiar finding that, in the workplace, people with an average IQ often outperform those with a high IQ. Interestingly, our brains nearly always have an emotional response to an event before we develop an appropriate reasoned response. Emotional intelligence, however, can improve your ability to use parts of your brain linked with rationality rather than reactivity so that raw emotions don't have as much influence on your behavior. And here's the exciting thing. Unlike general intelligence, which we're born with and which is largely unchangeable across a lifetime, Emotional intelligence can be improved with awareness and practice. What's more, we tend to get better at it the older we get. This is the finding of psychologists Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves, the authors of Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Before we delve into the book, a quick word on their expertise. Bradbury has a degree in clinical psychology from the University of California. He later attained two PhDs from the California School of Professional Psychiatry in Clinical Psychology and in Organizational Psychology. Jean Graves started out with a degree in clinical psychology from Stanford, then completed a PhD in organizational psychology at the California School of Professional Psychiatry. In 2001, the pair launched TalentSmart, a provider of emotional intelligence testing and training that has tested over half a million people. Emotional Intelligence 2.0 comes with its own Emotional Intelligence Appraisal Test. In this book, Insight, we'll explore the following key themes that underpin the author's idea of EQ. First, self-awareness, which is about accurately perceiving and predicting your emotions and knowing which events trigger them. Second, self-management, or the ability to manage your emotions to the benefit of yourself and others. Third, Social awareness, the ability to pick up on the emotions of those around you. And finally, social competence, acting effectively upon the emotions that you perceive in others to improve your relationship with them. We'll conclude by taking a wider look at the criticisms of emotional intelligence itself within psychology and its validity in terms of success in work and life. Self-awareness is a skill that requires a deliberate effort to understand the emotions that you have and where they come from. One of the conclusions that Bradbury and Graves draw from their research is that only 36% of people are able to accurately identify their emotions as they happen. Here is Bradbury himself speaking at a TED Talk. Okay, now, people always want to know 
how you can go about increasing your emotional intelligence. And I, I absolutely recommend that you test yourself and you find for you what your low areas are. For one person, it may be social awareness. For another person, it may be self-awareness. And that's a really great starting point. Improving emotional awareness requires making time for self-reflection. But the very act of thinking about your emotions can alone lead to improvement, the authors say. This means being okay with experiencing some discomfort about yourself and trying to accept it. If we feel shameful or guilty, for example, we often try to ignore these feelings and move on as soon as possible. But this will likely lead to those emotions resurfacing at times we might not expect or desire. Moreover, if we ignore these negative emotions, we're likely to commit these same errors again. Self-awareness includes being very clear on who pushes our buttons. Buttons are triggers that make us angry, anxious, or frustrated. The triggers may be other people. For example, a coworker who you never see eye to eye with. Without careful reflection, you might not realize that this person often sets you off in a bad mood and, in turn, you act negatively towards others. Upon knowing and accepting this, you can prepare in advance for when you encounter this person. Then you can try to turn things around to make the outcome beneficial rather than inflame things. We tend to label our emotions as good or bad without thinking too much about it. For example, we may label fear as bad without appreciating the benefits for safety and survival that fear provides. When we label our emotions in this way, it can prevent us from going deeper to understand what truly underlies them. If we suspend our judgment and think of our feelings rationally, we can move beyond them and their potential consequences. Think of it like you're talking to a friend. You're unlikely to view their actions and emotions with the same vehemence and intensity that you view your own. You can put them into context in a more practical way. Unchecked emotions can take a toll on our bodies. This means it's important to spot the sources of such emotions right away. Everything from canker sores to an upset stomach can be a sign that it's time to identify what's behind our feelings. Once we become self-aware and we make these connections, we're able to better deal with the sources and ultimately stop the source of the stress. The process of improving self-awareness is sometimes uncomfortable, and it takes time and patience to pause and actively reflect. One strategy is to keep a simple journal in which you write down your emotional experiences. After some reflection time and examination of your notes, it's possible to identify patterns that you might not otherwise recognize. You'll see how certain emotions triggered certain events and created ripple effects in the world around you. You'll also be able to see that daily moods come and go and that they don't affect your general well-being. The more effort you put towards self-awareness, the more you'll create a steady foundation from which smart actions can be taken. In this part, we began our dive into Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves' Emotional Intelligence 2.0. We learned the value of self-awareness as a starting point in gaining emotional intelligence. Discovering our buttons and weak points requires patient self-examination. We can grow beyond our negative patterns. Next time, we'll dig deeper into Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by learning about self-management and social awareness. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. In their number one New York Times bestselling book, Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves conducted extensive research into emotional intelligence, interviewing over half a million people in order to identify the traits that underpin high EQ. They lay out four key skills that, once adopted, will exponentially enhance your emotional intelligence. Last time, we broke down the first skill, self-awareness. In this part, we'll continue our exploration into Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by learning two more skills, self-management and social awareness. As humans, our brains are wired to react emotionally to signals and impetus before our reason kicks in. 
This pattern is a consequence of evolution. There was a time, thousands of years ago, when our reactions were all we had, the classic fight-or-flight instinct. They were good enough for survival in terms of providing food and mates. Now, although we still have emotional reactions to our experiences, we can become aware of these emotions and their sources. We can actively reason out the appropriate response and execute it. We can self-manage. Self-management begins with something basic that we might not always be cognizant of, our physical condition. If you're tired, for example, it's difficult to do anything effectively, let alone manage your responses to events that spark you off in some way. Making sure you've had enough sleep can make a huge difference in having calmer, more reasoned responses. Here is Bradbury speaking at a TED Talk. Silver bullet number two for increasing your EQ is to clean up, clean up your sleep hygiene. No blue light. Don't take anything that helps you sleep. Uh, wake up at the same time in the morning. These are all things that can help you to get your, your, your self-control under control. When you're charged up about something, taking slow, long breaths can also help to keep you on top of your emotions. You've likely heard the recommendation to slowly count to 10 when stressed. This causes breathing to slow, as opposed to the rapid breathing that can happen automatically as a reaction to stress. The reason slow breathing can help is because it engages the brain areas that support reasoning and control of our actions. It also sends a message to our brain to relax and be calm. The brain then repeats this message to the body. Some situations that trigger us occur regularly, and we can consider our responses in advance. We can pre-self-manage by visualizing a given situation that we expect to happen. Bradbury and Graves suggest visualizing yourself managing your emotions and responding effectively as you drift off to sleep at night, before a day when you predict a particularly difficult situation. In fact, they suggest carving out some quality time each day to consider emotional issues in an analytical way. This requires setting aside distractions like your phone or computer. Walking outdoors can be an especially effective time for problem visualizing and problem solving and working through your emotions. But no matter how much time we spend analyzing and trying to prepare in advance, there will be triggers that are unpredictable. For example, recall a time when what you thought would be a pleasant encounter soon turned for the worse. Through better awareness and management of your own emotions, you're more likely to enable a more accurate understanding of what underlies the behavior of those around you. That's what we turn to next. A big part of emotional intelligence is the adeptness to which we can gauge the emotions of others as well as our own. If you can accurately estimate what someone else may be experiencing, you're a long way towards predicting what they might be thinking. And when we can guess what others might be thinking, we can predict their actions. Social awareness is the ability to tune into someone else's emotions. It doesn't necessarily involve empathy, but simply knowing another person's emotional state. But that doesn't make it easy. People don't usually advertise their emotions, especially in a work setting. Even when others keep their emotional responses in check, it's still important to gauge what they may be feeling. In fact, it might even be more important because the feelings they're concealing could be unwelcome. Here is Bradbury during his TED Talk. How many of you have walked into a room full of people and you can just feel a mood in the room, even though you can't put your finger on it? These are the kind of emotional signals that are driving your brain. And people who are highly emotionally intelligent are very tuned into them. And once you're tuned into them, they tend to produce the behavior that you want. Improving social awareness involves assessing others' body language, facial cues, postures, and tone of voice, all nonverbal signals. Let's start with body language. If you're a fan of spy movies, you know that spies, both fictional and real, are excellent at determining if someone's words don't match their body language. When this is the case, they direct their actions based on what they see, not what they hear. You, too, can play 007 simply by actively observing others' movements to determine if they're nervous or uncomfortable, or, alternately, if they feel relaxed and at home. Reading body language can let you know how someone is really feeling and how to respond to them despite what they might be saying, a key skill in social awareness. 
Bradbury and Graves suggest that we can even learn from watching actors in our favorite movies or shows who are skilled at practicing body language cues. There might be more to learn from 007's poker face than you think. Similarly, people watching is a pastime that many of us naturally enjoy. Whether we engage in it actively, like seeking out a street view restaurant table, or passively, while noticing people in a waiting room. While we're watching people interact, it's not only nonverbal cues that we can pick up on. We can observe situations and imagine what it's like to be them and to understand the emotions they might be experiencing. This enables us to improve our awareness of what they might be trying to express. Simply asking others for their perceptions of you can do the trick. Bradbury and Graves believe that what others say about you is usually more accurate than what you think about yourself. Keep in mind, though, that you might need to engage your other EQ skills if you don't immediately like what you hear. And if you have a specific problem, the authors advise speaking to someone who isn't emotionally invested in it. You can only make decisions based on the whirl of thoughts and emotions in your head. Unless you specifically seek out new information or perspectives, your decisions are likely to be faulty as they're based on a single train of thought. The best advice, therefore, often comes from someone who can see things objectively and has no real emotional investment in what you decide. This is usually someone who's not that close to you. Indeed, seek out someone who you honestly don't know what they will advise. Social awareness, ironically, can mean drawing on the best minds beyond your social group. In this part, we continued our investigation into Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves' emotional intelligence. We broke down two more key skills, self-management and social awareness. Self-management is the ability to calm and maintain yourself even in triggering situations. Self-care, both psychological and physical, is essential to self-management. Social awareness is the assessment of nonverbal cues in others. It is watching, reading, and understanding the discomfort in another, even when their words indicate they are fine. Next time, we'll conclude our book insight by learning the final skill of emotional intelligence, relationship management. We'll have a quick recap, then consider the wider implications of Bradbury and Graves' bestseller. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. In today's fast-paced world of competitive workplaces and turbulent economic conditions, each of us is searching for effective tools that can help us to manage, adapt, and strike out ahead of the pack. It's not hard to make the case that emotional intelligence, or EQ, is equally, if not more important than cognitive intelligence, measured as IQ. But unlike cognitive ability, your EQ can be actively improved over the course of a lifetime. Infinitely practical, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves delivers expert advice for increasing your EQ to enable you to achieve your fullest potential. In this part, we're concluding our book insight by learning about the final skill of emotional intelligence, relationship management. We'll recap what we learned and consider the legacy of Bradbury and Graves' book. How you manage your relationships is a big part of emotional intelligence. And there's no better example of relationship management than engaging someone in a difficult but important conversation. Imagine a work situation where you need to have an important chat. You'll need to tap into your social awareness skills to understand the other person's perspective. Once you start talking to them, use your self-awareness skills to be aware of possible triggers. If they occur... Use self-management skills to prevent yourself from getting too defensive. But you don't need to have an in-depth conversation with someone in order to hone and execute relationship skills. Many of them can be practiced in relatively short interactions and statements. To start, being open and curious with those you work with is a skill that Bradbury and Graves suggest is absolutely and unequivocally part of being successful at your job. 
This requires both sharing information about yourself and demonstrating interest in your colleagues. It shows the value you place in them and will assuredly strengthen your relationship. But what if you need to provide evaluation or criticism as part of your job? Here, there's a strategy to remember that can be used to the benefit of all involved. When criticism is constructive, it's effective. Making the effort to understand why others did what they did, the information they had, and the amount of time they had for a given task, can put you in their shoes. You use this social awareness to develop guidelines for improvement. How much better this is than just getting angry. Asking for feedback, receiving it well, and acting on it are important elements of emotional intelligence. If you receive feedback that is critical, you may need to use all your self-awareness and self-management skills to deal with it. The process, however, involves gaining a better understanding of others' perspective and demonstrates the value you place in the person giving it to you. It means that you want to grow and learn. This is surely what every boss and employee wants. Regardless of whether your interaction with someone involves curiosity, criticism, or feedback, one thing to always consider is your acknowledgement of their feelings. Here is Bradbury during his TED Talk. When you master your emotions, when you become aware of them and when you're able to manage them effectively, it trickles into everything you do. It trickles into how you manage stress. It uh, affects how you give presentations, how you work in a team, how you make decisions. It's a foundational skill. We found that emotional intelligence when it comes to work explains about 60% of how you do. If you look at the percentage of top performers, what percentage of them are high in EQ, it's 90%. If you have poor relationship management skills, Demonstrating regard for others' emotions is a major step forward. Specifically, it's important to not only acknowledge what others feel, but respect that it may be completely different to how you feel about the same thing. A prime example is acknowledging that someone may be upset. Say a new coworker obviously seems off one morning. You could be tempted to think the upcoming meeting will distract them from whatever is bothering them. Moreover, you're not ready for the meeting and need to do some number crunching to get the figures you're obligated to discuss. But instead of looking for reasons to ignore your coworkers' problems, it could be more effective to set aside some time to show that you see they're upset and that you'll do what you can to help them before the meeting. If that requires too much time, offering to help after the meeting would likely be a gesture they'd appreciate. They may seem obvious. But using skills and strategies such as these helps to improve communication and maintain existing bonds. It can be the difference between a workplace where you dread entering each day and a happy, meaningful, and constructive one. Let's take a quick recap of the ideas that we've covered in this book Insight. First, we looked at how self-awareness is the foundation of emotional intelligence. We saw that it's important to understand what triggers us, but without labeling our emotions as good or bad. We saw how important physical condition is to self-management and how it's always possible to control how we react, even if we can't control the situation itself. We explored social awareness and how crucial it is to see nonverbal signs and the whole picture. Finally, we looked at relationship management putting these skills into practice, and knowing that if you put your focus on the other person in the situation, you can't go far wrong. The two big things to take away from this book are, first, that EQ can be a better predictor of success than IQ, and second, that it can be improved with practice. Top executives have embraced emotional intelligence because of its potential for unleashing better performance and so improve the bottom line but also because it seems to bring better relationships and improved work culture. As we conclude our look into Emotional Intelligence 2.0, let's discuss the reception and criticisms of the book. The term emotional intelligence first appeared in a 1964 paper by Michael Beldock, a professor of psychology at Cornell University. The concept gained popularity in Daniel Goleman's 1995 blockbuster, Emotional Intelligence. Since then, there's been a fair amount of criticism as to whether there are, in fact, any kind of intelligences different from cognitive intelligence, or IQ. It's argued that being smart with people and our own emotions are simply skills that use cognitive intelligence. 
It's argued that being smart with people and our own emotions are simply skills that use cognitive intelligence. Adam Grant, the organizational psychologist and author of Originals, has called emotional intelligence overrated. He doesn't dismiss it, but believes that it isn't as important a hiring factor as cognitive ability. Others have argued that EQ measures conformity rather than ability. Just because you have someone in your company who is empathetic and makes others feel good, this is no substitute for workload contribution. Some take criticism of EQ even further. Emotional intelligence is a neutral tool and therefore can be used for good and bad. When you know how to flatter people or push their buttons, you have them in your control and can manipulate them. Indeed, arguably, the original book to explore the power of emotional intelligence was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie back in 1936. Carnegie pioneered the idea that success was the result of putting the focus on the other person and always seeing things from their point of view. This was partly because it was just a good thing in itself, but it was also a route to career success, he said. But is emotional intelligence actually a necessity in advancing in the workplace? It's true that some of the greatest innovators have lacked EQ skills, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Mark Zuckerberg among them. On the other hand, the impact of more people-friendly figures, such as Barack Obama, Jeff Bezos, and Oprah Winfrey, would seem to counter that. Perhaps the first three succeeded despite, not because of, their lack of EQ. It's hard to argue that putting the focus on the other person and being attuned to how they're feeling can ever be a negative thing. As Bradbury and Graves point out, good decisions require far more than factual knowledge, they are made using self-knowledge and emotional mastery when they're needed most. In other words, good calls require taking in the bigger picture, not just the objective facts, but the people involved. You need other human beings to get on board, stay motivated, and act. Half the job of a boss is managing people and getting the best out of them, which surely requires a full set of emotional skills. Whether or not you call this an intelligence is almost beside the point. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.